Everyone is trying to distract us from this truth. And the truth is that every time you see a problem, it is in fact an opportunity to make things better. You're listening to the Profit First for Lawyers podcast, the official companion show to the book Profit First for Lawyers by R. John Robbins. Now, this podcast is for you if you want to bring home more profit while working less hours in the office, spending more time with your loved ones doing the things you actually want to do, and turning your office into a lean, mean, profit-breathing machine. So if you're tired of working for your law firm instead of your law firm working for you, stay tuned for some really practical insights that will get you the results you've always wanted. It's time to put your BS aside for the next few minutes and put yourself, your family, your firm, and your profit first. Welcome back to another episode of the Profit First for Lawyers podcast. I'm your host, Carly. And today we're sharing a clip from when I was joined in our virtual studio by million dollar law firm owner, Becky Moriello. Now you might remember that last time we shared about a self-limiting concept that Arjun calls the doctrine of sacrifice, which we've got linked in our show notes below if you wanna take a look. But today we're gonna share how Becky was able to help more clients free up their time and even accomplished a decades long dream that greatly impacted their community and their clients for the better all because they began the work of liberating themselves from the doctrine of sacrifice. This was a really fun interview. And I was pretty impressed at the candor and and even the openness that Becky shared with us. I I think their story is really going to resonate with law firm owners who, well, who may also wonder if they should forget law and just get into construction. (laughs) All right, let's roll the clip. Becky, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I am really excited to get to speak with you. Thank you so much for having me. I've been having a great time listening to it. Can you give me a little bit of your um, the the story of your background? How did you get into law and, and what drew you to immigration specifically? My parents got me a subscription to what used to be called Penny Power, and then it was Zillions, which is the kids' report the kids version of consumer reports. And I used to just read that thing obsessively all while I was growing up. And I wanted to be a um, consumer advocate. I wanted to do that sort of work, but there just weren't a lot of jobs in that. And then I just kind of honestly fell into immigration law. (laughs) Well, it sounds like that has been a really rewarding place to be. I know that you've, you've done a lot of good in your time practicing immigration law. Can you tell me a little bit about the journey from, you know, you've graduated from law school, you're going to work as a lawyer for somebody else's practice, and then along the way you decide to start your own law firm. Um, What was the story behind that? I honestly always wanted to work for a nonprofit. Like I, this was, I was purely do-gooder about the whole situation. And, but I graduated during the recession in North Carolina. Nonprofits were completely non being funded. So there were no, none of those jobs. Most of the people that I graduated with couldn't even get jobs because I spoke Spanish. I was able to get a job with a criminal defense firm that handled a lot of Spanish speaking clients. So I, I did the criminal defense for about 10 months and then I moved into a, another criminal defense firm doing their immigration because deportation had really picked up in North Carolina during that time. So I knew like a little bit about deportation defense. And so this other criminal attorney, I worked for him for about three years. Great guy. I learned about some about the practice of law from both of these firms. They were both very, very different. Neither one would I say was particularly well run, but they were poorly run in completely different ways. So I, you know, I was with this second firm for about three years and then a long story. And then I became a solo. Becky, you, you mentioned that these two firms were poorly run in different ways. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And then when you started your own firm, how did you try to mitigate that? I believe that both of those owners were doing the best that they could. And I believe that they wanted to help their clients and do good in the world. Of course, I still learned from both of them and I wanted to do things differently. Once I found myself as 
a firm owner. I ran my firm terribly in a third different way. Uh, so yeah, there are lots of ways to poorly run a law firm. Turns out, I'm sure we could think of a few more. Uh, yeah, I did a terrible, terrible job. Uh, basically, every single mistake you could possibly make, I probably made it. Uh, yeah, so that was that was our life for the first several years. We've been talking a lot about personal goals and personal dreams. Um, did you have a lot of long-reaching personal goals and dreams and things that you were working towards? No, 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 no. I didn't think about that at all. Uh, it, you know, now I I think a lot about my personal goals, my financial goals, my professional goals. But to me, when I was a solo, I didn't even think about the law firm management side of things, the law firm ownership side of things. I really thought that it was just this is how you're being a lawyer and it's just structured a little bit differently. That's it. Yeah. Be the I best just, lawyer you possibly can be and the rest will fall into place. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, of course I had to hire staff, but I didn't think there was anything really more to it than that. Like you get someone, you pay them, and then they do some work for you. And it turns out it's more complicated than that. And so is like everything else with running a firm. Um, but no, I was I was very day to day, get the work done, and then presumably your life will also fall into place. That's that that was the fantasy world that I was living in. <laughs> how successful was your law firm at the time? Do you remember? So how successful was it professionally? Um, I, I'm gonna start with that because I would say that. That was the area that it was doing best. Now, spoiler alert, my firm is now doing way, way more professionally for the world. And that was the biggest freaking myth that I had. Because I, like I said, when I went to law school, I always wanted to work for a nonprofit. And when that didn't happen, it, um, at that point, I was like, okay, well, I want my firm to be sort of low bono. Like I, money was never super important to me. And, you know, I wanted to make a living, but I, I didn't want to, like, I had no interest in getting rich because I wanted, I thought those were mutually exclusive. I wanted to do good. Therefore I couldn't do well. Right. Mm. Um, so I wanted to be low bono. And in fact, my, even my website, my email address was raleighimmigration.org. It still is our, our email addresses. And I was like, great. I loved that because I wanted to be a quasi nonprofit. First few years was I was running around like a crazy person, just working my ass off nights, weekends, just cranking out cases. I, at HTM, they talk about that when you start a firm, you're in hustle market sell mode. I never was just right place, right time. I had a reputation. I got the cases in the door. You know, they called, my, the sales call was very quick and they signed and that was it. It was very easy to get clients. So I was just working, 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 cranking out legal work. And for pennies, just super, super cheap. I mean, I was doing immigration law. My clients were undocumented and as part of their cases, I had to get their tax returns a lot of the time. And not infrequently, my undocumented clients were earning more money than I was. Mm -hmm. And that was confusing more than anything. Yeah. Like literally, I was like, what am I doing wrong? Should I go work in construction? <laughs> like I went, I don't know. I'm like, I just, I couldn't, I didn't understand what I was doing wrong because even though I didn't, want or feel like I needed to, or, you know, I didn't want to be rich, but I was like, but I should be making more than my undocumented clients. Like I went to school for a million freaking years. I'm bilingual. Like I'm a lawyer. So I was really just confused more than like, I wasn't really angry. I was just confused for, for years. And so I just figured, you know, give it time. And honestly, I didn't have the hours in the day to sit there and really contemplate it. I was just like, looked at the tax return. Huh? Okay. That's weird. And just kind of kept going with my life. 
And the firm, you know, to take it back to financial, it so it certainly clearly wasn't serving me personally. And uh, financially, like I was paying myself $3,500 a month. I did not feel like that was bad. The reason that I even picked $3,500 a month was because in the very early days, I would just informally transfer money to myself whenever I needed it. And then eventually I realized that it was averaging out to $3,500 a month. So then I just set up an auto transfer of $3,500 a month and that was it and it was fine. And I never went without. I, I got myself everything that I wanted. If I wanted to go out to eat, I did. I lived where I wanted. I drove what I wanted. I, I, I never felt like I was doing without. That was just what I wanted. And, um, but simultaneously, I was just still confused when I would get those tax returns in. So um, within a few years, you know, two or three years, we got up to about $500,000 a year gross, the firm. And that was with knowing nothing, just, chaos, me working my ass off. Was the confusion enough of an impetus to get you to try to find a coaching program? What what were some of the things that were going on that, that kind of got you to take action? Because it sounds like this went on for a couple of years, right? There were two things that happened that got me really pumped about something's got to give. One is that I passed the specialization exam in North Carolina. So only 4% of North Carolina attorneys are board certified specialists. And then I turned 40 and I'm like, okay. And then it like all clicked in my head. I was like, all right, hang on, hang on, hang on. You are fucking 40 years old. You're not a kid anymore. Like this whole time when I was just hustle and grind, I'm like, well, you're in your 30s. You're a kid, like whatever. But then I'm like a grown ass adult. I'm bilingual. Like I serve my clients in Spanish. I don't use an interpreter. I'm in the top 4% of attorneys. What the flying fuck? Like I was mad. I was legit furious at that point. Like when those things clicked, I went from being confused to being pissed off. So I still didn't know what to do, but I was more, even more inspired to figure it the fuck out, fit for it. I'm like, all right. So I, over the course of the years, I did raise my rates somewhat. So we were no longer a nonprofit or a quasi nonprofit. And <laughs> even though I, um, in a way I could see my extreme we fucked up firm and just be all resentful. But no, that was a huge opportunity for me. I personally believe that I am so invested in learning how to run my firm better because I ran it so terribly for so long. So we're at a boiling point now. What happened next? So what happened was at that point, like, so I'm in these Facebook groups and I'm asking all of these practice management questions, which everyone does on occasion, but I was doing it way more than anyone else. And in those groups, sometimes people would mention different practice management companies and there were several of them. And, you know, I would look into the different ones and got on some different mailing lists. So that's how I got on HTM's mailing list. I was intrigued by HTM. Um, but I also recognized very quickly because I talked to a lot of current and former members and I heard very mixed things. I heard a lot of positive feedback and a lot of negative feedback. I heard from people who had worked in firms that were owned by an HTM member. And I heard things like, oh, after she joined HTM, she turned into a money crazed lunatic. Like I heard that. And so, you know, I took all of that feedback and just kind of kept it in mind. And I was just, you know, I got on their mailing list and um, I spent, I think it was probably about a full year on HTM's mailing list, reading everything, every single email, clicked every link, watched every video. So after a year of compulsively following them, I was sold. I was convinced. I was like, these guys know what they're talking about. Absolutely. It was a huge investment. It was literally 10 times as much as the other practice management companies that I was with. 
And, but I knew something had to change. And I knew that these guys knew what they were talking about. So I was like, all right, let's do this because I want to change my firm. And these guys know what they're talking about. So let's do this. And did it turn you into a uh, money hungry law firm owner, Becky? No. Uh, <laughs> um, it made me, it made the firm run better is what it did. And money does go hand in hand with that. That was not my intention. So I talked to a lot of prospective members and the most common reason that people are thinking about joining HTM is financial benefit. That's the most common. The second most common is about their personal life, you know, wanting to get more free time. Yeah. For me, it was absolutely the opposite. I mean, money wasn't even a, a consideration, but if we could just get to the place where the firm was running better, where I wasn't allowing the staff to allow things to fall through the cracks, you know, where the client, where we were providing better service. Cause honestly, that was my biggest problem with my firm was that it wasn't running well. Like I was willing to continue with the long days if only the firm would run better. I'm I'm a big fan of like efficiencies and um, making things run better, faster, uh, more smoothly. So in a perfect world, that sounds great. I wasn't even at that level. I didn't have the capacity to think at that level about having things so systematized that it was like a machine. I just knew that the clients were not getting the level of service that they deserved, that I wanted to provide for them. And so that I honestly would have been thrilled if I had paid that money to HTM and all I got out of it was that the firm ran better, even if it meant that I still had to work those long days. But I was so excited. Arjun also kept talking about working shorter days. I was like, really? Okay. And you know, I watched him say it enough and I watched enough examples from other firm owners. I was like, apparently this is a thing that's going to happen. So let's see. And, you know, I'm a work in progress. I, it's not like I suddenly have this life of luxury, but I do go to the gym now, which I literally have never done regularly in my entire life. Wow, Becky, that's amazing. I'd like to know from a personal standpoint, too, and I'm sure audience would love to hear what made the difference in your consistency and being able to like follow through with yourself. It was really having a little bit of time freed up. Like I've got my staff is doing their jobs for the most part. I think the numbers are even easier for comparison purposes. I mentioned that the firm was doing between 450 and 550 for several years. Uh, 2021, and this is unusual, but because I talk, you know, we talk, we're very open about numbers at HTM and most firms do start making more during even their first quarter at HTM, certainly their first year. We did not. My first year in HTM, and let me um, go, I don't have this memorized. I have it approximately memorized, but I asked my <laughs> uh, staff, because I asked my staff and like a magic presto changeo, like I asked them for things and they just send it to me. It's like, oh, this is nice. Um, So uh, yeah, 2021, our gross revenue was 480, which was my first year in HTM. So that was just right along the same lines. Then bam, 2022, 743, 55% increase where the national average for law firm growth is 5% every year. And we were all of a sudden at 55%. And then in 2023, we did 1.4 million, which is an 85% wow. increase. So you know, that has enabled me to have better staff, to have management, because I like, while I have become a better manager, it was a really fucking low bar. Like, so the fact that I'm better does not mean that I'm good right now. So uh, I do still need that, um, you know, I could either learn how to do it or get someone else to do it. So I, I do it <laughs> both. Uh, I'm not completely out of management, but I do have that layer built in there. So it's like, yeah, this, they just do their jobs usually. And how has it been 
as far as the community, the people that you're able to help your clients? That was my number one reason. I mean, I, I wanted to work for a nonprofit. I wanted to help people. One of the myths that I completely believed, and I see that at least most immigration lawyers that I talk to believe, is that if the way for us to help the most people is by us helping the most people with our own two hands, doing the work, cranking out the work, and of course, charging very little for it. And just almost being a martyr, you know, like Arjun says, the doctrine of sacrifice. It always felt more just, we need to do this ourselves. And at this point, and I don't know what other attorneys think when I tell them this, but this is what it is right now. It's that whole teach a man to fish thing. And I teach so many people to fish. I do so much community outreach. I do so much myth busting presentations because there's a lot of terrible information in the undocumented immigrant community. I, I go around and I um, spread this uh, information and answer questions for free. And Arjun helped me see how I can, oh, I do fundraisers. I use my time conducting fundraisers for nonprofits. I informally help other nonprofits, their attorneys, their DOJ reps ask me questions. So by answering their questions and guiding them and mentoring them and mentoring law students, I have time to do all of that too. I am amplifying my effect exponentially. Wow. That, that is a, a whole lot of good stuff, Becky. I, number one, congratulations for coming full circle for what it sounds like was kind of your dream from the beginning, right? Was to help nonprofits. Yes. I mean, it's a work in progress, right? I mean, the firm nearly doubled last year. We're hoping to do the same this year. I have so many plans for my community outreach stuff, making it even bigger and helping way, way more people. I see so much potential there. That's one of my favorite things about working with Arjun is I think, um, he is kind of the, the center of the storm a lot of times of seeing people who have refocused on on their dreams. And I just feel like it's it's a happier way to live. So Becky, I know that you've been listening to the show for a while and you know that we usually ask or we often ask our guests to select kind of a, a clip or uh, something that Arjun has said that had a lot of impact for them. And you actually gave me two. Now, I, we don't normally play two, but I agree that these are really, number one, kind of unusual. I think especially the first one is. Um, and number two, I think really impactful. So let's go ahead and play them both. Um, do you want to go ahead and introduce clip number one? Sure. So when we were talking, the first thing absolutely that immediately came to mind in terms of what I've heard from Arjun that was the most impactful for me was absolutely hands down this poem because I had never heard anything like this before. I'm intrigued. Okay, let's go ahead and play this first one. Let's roll the clip. I bargained with life for a penny and life would pay no more. However, I begged at evening after I counted my scanty score. For life is, is a just employer. He gives you what you ask. But once you have set the wages, you must bear the task. I worked for a menial's hire only to learn dismayed that any wage I had asked of life, life would have willingly paid. You know, it's funny because I have read Think and Grow Rich. That's um, uh, another thing that um, Arjun has done another project with that. And I recently listened to them all. But I don't remember hearing that particular poem. When was it, do you remember, that he recited this one for you? He's mentioned it several times. And I am an I've been a member of HTM for a year and a quarter at this point, and, or three years and a quarter at this point. And I am just an utter junkie of the app. Like I listen to it compulsively. I don't recall when the first time was, but I knew it was fairly early. And really the crux of it is 
Life is a just employer. It gives you what you ask. And hearing the explanation of that, I was thrown away and I was furious. I was furious when I realized that it had to be true because there was nothing else that made any sense. Because remember, I was broke and working my ass off. Just everything I had done throughout my adult life, I was always broke, including when I was a fucking lawyer. And I I was like, this makes no sense. I didn't understand. I was like, what is going on? And that poem was the only thing that made any sense. I was like, oh, because I didn't ask for more. Oh, that's so great. Okay. I think that you gave us a pretty good explanation of this one. Let's move into clip number two. Do you want to go ahead and introduce this one? Okay. So this took longer for me to hear. And actually, I heard it the first time from a member, uh, Carrie Schultz, who I believe she coined the phrase, or at least she's the first one that I heard it from, problem tunity. So you get a problem and you find the opportunity. And then hearing Arjun's deeper explanation of it, which I most remember from the really great workshop where he gave a really in-depth explanation of that every problem, every problem that you find contains an opportunity. There is an opportunity buried in every problem. And the bigger the problem even more exciting because there's an even bigger opportunity in it and you just have to find it. And on the flip side, every opportunity is wrapped in a problem. So when you see an opportunity, what most people do is they see the opportunity and then they go, oh, but, oh, but, oh, but there's this problem. Oh, there's this. Okay. Well, we're just going to stay here status quo because eh, that opportunity won't work. That no, 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 no. Every opportunity is wrapped in a problem. So you just have to get through that problem and bam, you got the opportunity. (laughs) I love that. All right, let's go ahead and roll it. Inside of every problem, there is an opportunity. I'm going to tell you something that most of you probably already intuitively know and intuitively understand, but it's surprising how few people act on this simple observation of reality. If you think about it, you couldn't have any opportunities if there wasn't a problem. Because what is, a, what, what is an opportunity other than a chance to make something better, right? So the, 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 the mindset that we need to constantly be working on, the, the mindset that I'm constantly working on too, right? Because the world is trying to get us to get distracted from this. The 24-hour news cycle, everyone is trying to distract us from this truth. And the truth is that every time you see a problem, it is in fact an opportunity to make things better. Becky, I really like that. Now, why, um, why do you think that this hit you with such force? So I had a big problem And I was like, well, all I can do is try to find the opportunity here. So I thought and thought and thought and thought and thought, and I found it. And I said, you know what? This is my only option. So let's make it work. And I did. And since then, I have been um, finding problem opportunities all over the place. And I've, I've, I've always been a creative person. And just in terms of like, not an artist, but just, I, I'm always thinking of ideas and I, I'm, I just consider myself creative. And so, and I love brainstorming. And so when I see a problem, I'm like, okay, let's do it. You know, whether it's for myself or someone else. Oh, I think that's so powerful too. It, it, um, you know, one of Arjun's favorite books is, um, the power of Ted. And I think that's a really great way to switch your mindset if you find yourself getting into the victim mindset to switch it back into the creator. Um, you know, uh, switch your mindset from from being put upon to being curious and um, kind of open to uh, the universe or whatever it is that you believe um, to find what is this trying to teach me or how can I 
use this as a jumping board? How can I use this as a stepping stone? Um, you know, when I think of gift wrap, <laughs> right, this is the thing that I have to get out of the way so I can get to the good stuff. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that word curiosity is everything. Yes. And, you know, I do have to say that I personally don't believe that this is 100% always true. I still believe that it is a useful and necessary almost just really, really, really useful framework to believe in. Yeah. Oh, I still like that though. I, I do think that that switch of mindset really makes a difference. Um, I think you've brought a lot of of real meaty content that that is not only inspiring, but I think there's a lot of actionable stuff here too. Can I ask you, um, for those listening, if there is another law firm owner um, who is maybe struggling with some of the same things, right? Maybe they are trying to find more information on how to better manage their law firm or how to better serve their clients or how to make a living wage. What's one of the things that you did that somebody right now could go and do right now to course correct and to start feeling some of that relief? The concept of that work flows to the lowest paid competent person. There mm. is this saying, you know, about that, oh, nobody is too good to take out the trash. And I'm like, it's not that anyone's too good to take out of the trash. It's that it doesn't make any sense for an attorney to take out the trash. As an example, if you're in the office and the, the senior attorney is the only one there and the toilet's overflowing, well, obviously the senior attorney is going to jump in and plunge the toilet. But under no so if there's an emergency you do what you got to do but under normal circumstances work goes to the lowest paid competent because when people hear this particularly when attorneys cuz not attorneys get it for the most part but when attorneys hear this they get deaf for a second and they don't hear the word competent and it's not that you're too good to edit your own brief we are at at the end of the day this is all coming back to serving the clients better. And I did not misspeak there. It all comes back to serving the clients better. Everything with making your firm run better, it's because of the clients and serving them better, giving, not overcharging them. I mean, I think that makes sense too. Arjun talks about this when he's, he talks about having clients pay for time rather than for value right? Clients should be paying for value and not for time. And he usually brings this up in, in um, or at least in the instances that I've heard him, it's usually in concert with making sure that your uh, physical plant is running well, right? That, that you um, are investing in the right equipment so that it doesn't take five minutes for a page to load and that, you know, your paralegals aren't spending 10 minutes fighting with the printer before it spits out a document. Um, and, and that that is, you know, having your clients pay more for time than for value, because if they had those 10 minutes back per document that they needed to struggle with, right, that they could be spending that pursuing more valuable pursuits for the clients, right, and providing more value to the clients. So I, I, that makes total sense to me, right? The, the lowest paid competent person um, so that you can deliver more value to the client and free up more of those hours for being able to dig in and, and do more. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, paying the attorney's time to do paralegal work just ends up making the client pay for more of attorney time. Yeah. I think that's so, so valuable. Um, Becky, if, if we had any viewers who reached out to us for questions about this or who had questions for you specifically, um, would you be okay if I passed those your way? Would you be willing to answer some of those? Oh, absolutely. I do that all the time. And you know what? I don't know if we have time, but I just thought of one more tip for. Yeah, bring uh, it on. That are dealing with chaos. And that is don't be afraid to make decisions. Your firm is not a democracy. I look back and laugh about there's one particular instance that comes to mind, just a general firm management question that we spent like two hours in a meeting. And I'm like, in retrospect, I'm like, 
why did I even care about their opinions? Like, yes, it uh, impacted them, but just just make some decisions. At the end of the day, you're the owner and make a decision and move on. And just think about all the waste, all the, the cost of everyone's time that is in that meeting. Just make a decision and move on. That is great advice too, Becky. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that you'll indulge me. It's something I love to ask all of anybody that I interview. Um, I love the variety of answers that I get. And it is, what is something that you've taken action on in the last year that has brought a lot of profit to your life, right? Where where profit in this instance is Arjun's definition, which is exchanging something that you value less in order to get something you value more. What's something you've put in place in the last year? Getting a PLA, which most of our viewers don't know what that is. It's a law firm administrator. It's a manager, is somebody with high level, high level management experience. And he's only been with us for two months at this point. So he's still in training. And even still, it's amazing so far. Well, if you have any specific questions for Becky, feel free to send those my way at podcast at Profit First for Lawyers, and I will make sure to pass those on um, so that we get those answers for you. Becky, it has been Truly a delight having you on today. I am so glad that we got to sit down and kind of do this deep dive. Thank you for being willing to be vulnerable and share some of these, um, the specific numbers and the pitfalls and the challenges, because I think I, I'm speaking for myself here. Um, sometimes it's so much easier to take a look at where the parallels are and figure out, oh, that's how we get over the next hump. Anyway, I just think it's going to be really, really valuable to our audience. Thank you for coming. I hope it is. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. And yeah, I'm <laughs> glad to talk to anybody. Hey, guys. So quick note here. We really wanted to make sure that we weren't just giving you profitable concepts, but that we were also providing some resources to help you take action and see the results in your own lives. Now, some of these resources are going to be downloadable. Some of them are going to be watchable and others will be live, but all of them will be offered to you completely for free, no strings attached. Now, we do host a Profit First for Lawyers workshop several times per year all over the U.S., and Arjun has finally agreed to let me offer it to our listeners again for free. So if you're ready to get serious about making your law firm more profitable, click the link in our show notes below and reserve your seat now. Now, fair warning, we do cap attendance at these events to make sure that attendees get some real laser focus on the things that are important to them. And we do always run out of seats. So make sure that you snag your seat. If you want even more insights and even more Arjun, don't miss it. problem Now, that is such a fun blend of words. I'm about to insert that into my everyday vocabulary. <laughs> Look, I had such a great time speaking with Becky. And I was really inspired by the concept of taking a problem and digging into it to find the opportunity uh, of looking at every problem, every challenge with fresh eyes and approaching it with curiosity. Um, that's what we've got for you today, folks. Let's stay tuned next time as we tackle something that many seven-figure law firm owners say is directly responsible for their law firm's growth today. We're going to tell you the quote-unquote secret that Arjun has used to springboard law firms into their definition of success. We'll see you then. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Profit First for Lawyers. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, tell a friend. And visit ProfitFirstForLawyers.com forward slash action to download the resources that are going to help you put these concepts to work for your law firm. Your future self will thank you for it. And we will see you next time.